the reason we're recording this is that it was our 10-year anniversary. We made a prediction early on of how likely it is that we'll still be together in 10 years. How about we make predictions from today about how likely it is that we're still together in one year and 10 years. Think about it for a moment, and then we will yell out the numbers at the same time. So for one year, 99%. 99%. Then in 10 years. <gasps> Hello and welcome to the Win Win Podcast. Today's episode is all about love and relationships because I am speaking to my dearest significant other, Igor Kurganov. Igor and I recently celebrated 10 years together, so we decided to try this experimental episode where we interview each other about what makes a healthy relationship. Because the thing is, a truly good relationship is arguably the most positive sum win winny thing you can ever find, where two people create something much larger than the sum of their individual parts. So on that note, here is my conversation with Igor Kurganov. It's like the phones have a force field. They're, they're in. What are you doing? Looking at my belly button. <laughs> You're navel gazing. <laughs> I see. Okay. So how do we start this? You just talk. Okay, go ahead. Okay. What did the people on Twitter ask? Well, no, I don't want to start. I want to. Why wanna... not? Just start with that. We can what? afterwards do an intro. We, All right. We, no one knows what the. Why, why do you need an intro right now? Because just every other episode has some kind of. I normally have like a nice. Maybe that's a mistake. Question. Just... All right. We've been together for ten years. Okay, that's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, keep going. We've been together for ten years. Don't get so rattled. Just you because so much. <laughs> interrupting you come on and it's going. normally been great yes although i'm drastically rethinking okay um and no it has actually been wonderful yes and i think the main question that people want to know is what is our secret ingredient and i don't off the top of my head i don't think i can distill it down to one thing the secret to happiness is having low expectations <laughs> 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 um no. So people want to know what a secret is? I don't know. That's a big question to start with. What's a secret? Communication. Communication. Definitely communication. Okay. What, what, do, what is unique about the, our style of communication? We're very, very, very honest with each other. We try to uh, be very direct with each other uh, and are good at it, actually. We know that while the other is commenting on mistakes or gives feedback to the other that it comes from a place of we are one team we are aware that there's like meta coordination basically in the uh, feedback giving define meta coordination well like we we've agreed that this would be the better style to have um, communication and our general pro way of being with each other which involves sometimes like butting heads on various things very quickly rather than trying to optimize for each individual moment being one of um, calm, harmony, pleasantness. <laughs> it sounds like it's awful to be us, but actually some <laughs> friends experience it a little bit like that because um, we do very quickly tell each other, I didn't like that, stop doing this, That that's annoying, why do you do this? You have this pattern, you always do that. We actually say it, like the classic, um, like, Things idea. you're meant to do. Yeah, like talking about the concrete thing, but making it into a general claim. Um, that's like, don't do that. With us, it's, we do that quite a bit. And actually, our reaction most often is, oh, yeah, I actually may have this uh, general bias. So we have this theory, which is uh, the like we, we discussed kind of like the, the relationships can be, uh, or rather the communication in relationships that we have observed among friends. You were plotted on a graph with two axes and on the x-axis you have um, like how soft versus aggro the conversation is. The communication is happening. This is like a zero and here is the 10, let's say. And then here is the free on the y-axis you have the frequency of how often it occurs. Um, that style of communication occurs within the relationship. I think a lot of couples spend their time in kind of like a 
um, like a dumbbell. Like they're like everything is nicey nice the entire time, very often, very little time spent in three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then because it builds up, it it jumps and like they fight quite hard. Right, really hardcore fights. Yeah. yeah. We spend our time. It's basically very little, nicey nice, <laughs> like zero <laughs> to one is one. It's very like little. One, one yeah. we we yeah, but little. And then it builds up. It's like a lot of two, three, four, five, and then it goes down and basic and pretty much no nine or t like no nine or t definitely no ten. No ten. Basically no, no nine. Nines. I don't know, like once a year a nine or something, and some eights and sevens very yeah. rarely. Like I can't think. I actually can't think of the last time we had like a real fight. Yeah, and I th basically my the our theory goes that because we get to um, clear out a lot of stuff in this um, two, three, four, five, six region. We never fall into the stronger, uh, worse explosion because there is no built up resentment, built up kind of desire to now say it all finally, etc. It just stuff doesn't right. build I up if you talk about the, 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 what you're getting at is that we never bite our tongues, or very rarely. Yeah, the I reason to bite a tongue is when we're in public or among friends or like at a party or something, and even then even we then often we don't. don't exactly, <laughs> which is why many of our friends feel. That it's like, ah, oh, mom and dad are fighting. But, well, and new friends are like, oh, 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 God, you guys, please don't fight. And we're like, no, 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 this is, yeah. this is our normal place. So, and then the question is, uh, what is it that makes our communication function? What are the, like, prerequisites that had to be in place so that we can have this direct, quick, honest conversation? And I think they are um, one we respect each other's opinion a lot. Yeah. So then you want to listen to the other, obviously. Um, we know that the intention is to be on the same team. For me, at least, I feel like this deep sense of security that even if there is a major conflict or an argument about something, it's not ever going to be, a, well, that's it then. Mm -hmm. I have like zero concern that you would leave and so on. And I think a lot of people don't actually have that luxury in a relationship. Yeah. To bring it to three words, it would be uh, security. Then the other thing was trust and respect. I think you could get away with just respect and trust. You actually don't necessarily need security. If you have full trust and full respect, then you're also already very highly enabled in a converse uh, to have good communication. But security just helps. It's, it's like yes. a kind of like positive undercurrent underneath that allows you to reduce the worry about the bottom falling out at any point. Right. And that's that's useful. It's like if you can cap the downside, then usually you can take much higher risk. Well, that's the other thing. Our love language is shit talking and like mm -hmm. game banter is truly like what we both enjoy doing. Like we wake up every morning and our current obsession is backgammon and it, we start the day with a cup of coffee and... <laughs> smack talking each other to death mm -hmm. um that's how we get fired up for the day and <laughs> it's wonderful and so that like slightly harsh or like intense language fiery language just flows over into our natural state but yes. i i never feel like i've bottled anything up ever and i don't think you do either so i mean it will occasionally still happen right we're not perfect at this no. like what do you mean you never, like when you s just said you never bottled anything up, wh wh what's the well, extreme bottling up that you were excluding here? I don't imagine you meant something like three hours, 10 hours, 10 days, right? You've definitely had a thought that you haven't expressed for a few immediately. days. Immediately, yes, yeah, yes. Right, but what, what, so what, what did you mean when you just said that? Or were you speaking in superlatives? Because I feel like there's not really anything that I can't say to you. Mm -hmm. It it so rarely bottles up like i get that one that that one time like i had a crush on someone let's say i felt like i couldn't immediately express it for like a, a week or so because it was like the first time i had noticed someone else since we've been together mm -hmm. basically and i i was like oh what does this mean what does this mean but then eventually i blurted it out to you and you were like okay yeah that happens i mean we're going to be together for a long long time you're going to get crushes on people yeah and i was like oh Okay, and then basically after that moment, I was like, well, there's nothing I can't say to him. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the the idea there simply is that if you are going to be together with each other for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it would be very odd to literally, to, to have the expectation that the most likely outcome of amount of crushes 
each of you will have is zero. Like that doesn't, in a functioning good relationship, not because of issues, in a functioning good relationship, the expectation shouldn't be zero. Right. That doesn't make any sense over a period of 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Right, we are, it probably means you're dead We're inside biological at that beings. Point. Exactly. That's fine. Winston <laughs> or a backpack. Like that's <laughs> people okay, well, Winston is the tortoise for those oh. who are wondering, not like our <laughs> polyamorous lover or something <laughs> who lives with us. But on the bottle up thing, actually it, it maybe that that does maybe you're right even in the never because not expressing something in the moment can be out of just oh I'll do it later or oh I can't do this and the one is bottling up versus the other one isn't right so right. just because you expressed it later doesn't mean you bottle anything up so maybe actually your frequent expression later knowing that you can express it later does mean you're, it's just not a bottle up type of thing yes and yeah. and it's I mean there I guess the like trade-off with because I am like the more emotionally volatile one in the relationship um the trade-off with me feeling like I'm comfortable to always sort of express how I'm feeling could be that therefore I would go too much into like not self any kind of moderation and but I think we actually have that in balance too because um like a, a thing that always stuck with me that you said was like look you don't get to have more than like two really big dramas a month something like that on average if you're if you're having five dramas a month or ten dramas a month where it's like ah the, the sky is falling clearly your brain is miscalibrated like like that's just not like our lives are good lives are fine that like, was there was a few months into our relationship i had <laughs> to tell you sorry love you but you're just not that important you don't have three important things a day every day for a few days that's just right like presidents even have more calibr like had to calibrate their thing on the basis of the important things elon musk has like important things and he still doesn't get like upset five times a day about the thing yeah, yeah. i mean to be clear i wasn't getting upset five times a day well sometimes okay, that's the sure. thing i think but that I, I pro it's more <laughs> i think the time when i expressed this was probably when you were getting upset about something yeah i mean it was, it was like oh on. this thing happened today then i had to deal with that bureaucratic nightmare and that's incredibly upsetting and then this in work life is like slightly uncomfortable and that's incredibly upsetting it's like mm, okay the bureaucratic thing is irrelevant the work life thing is like how does that uh compare to the other things you expect to experience within your work life over a period of time if you're this emotional about a like if you were to sort them like the thing number 35 per year guess what? <laughs> One, you have to be upset 34 more times. And then when the thing that is still 10x worse, are you going to be 10x more upset? Good luck with that. Right. What you did well is you didn't necessarily try and be like, look, you don't have to have a, five dramatic things every single day. Uh, you, you didn't do it like right in the peak of when I was blowing up, but like you waited until I was in a sort of, I'd calm down a bit basically. And then you're like, okay, now you're calm. Can we just talk about this? as a general thing like pay attention like do you see me getting this upset this often about like a random like you know bureaucratic thing or missing a missing an opportunity or a meeting or something no so observe yourself you basically like would you, you'd find you'd be good at finding a balance of like shine showing the mirror to myself when i was being unreasonable um without mistiming it when i was in an emo basically reading when i'm in a in a sufficiently calm emotional state that i can actually input information because i think that's a mistake a lot of people make is that they try and like fix the person there and then in the moment when they're being irrational like you know let let the person's fight or flight turn off yes. you're not going to convince anyone of anything while they're in the, the heightened state totally um so yeah i mean very rarely sometimes you will but it's yeah, you kind of, it's, it's hard to fully get there. You need to like fight along and then reach some crescendo <laughs> of the fight where it's, but that's just, or you just wait it out until it cooled down and then you discuss it and the person looks back at it and it's just better. Another thing that we developed is, uh, let's say we're actually arguing about something and whichever one of us is first to notice that we're actually in an argument because that's the thing when you're in the heat of an argument you're so in the heat you're kind of you don't you're, you're unable to take a higher perspective very easily that's by by definition you're in you're in this like amplified angry state but whichever one of us first is able to notice the situation that's going on 
will go <laughs> and make this cat hissing sound at the other one. <laughs> exactly. For what it's worth, it's not usually that a fight is actively happening. It's, that's actually, it's more often that um, driving somewhere and for the last 30 minutes, uh, each time someone says something, the reaction by the other is like every, we are reacting like back it's not even like active fighting it's just you're taking the uncharitable annoyed interpretation of anything alex Biner asks uh, what is the role of forgiveness in our relationship uh, in other words can forgiveness help bring us out of zero-sum dynamics within a relationship and back into harmony i don't think that forgiveness is what changes zero-sum dynamics i think the you can forgive for having been like zero summy where a relationship obviously should be win-win um, because you're making each other grow and better. That's the like one of the fundamental parts of being happy about a relationship. So zero sumness would be really weird. But no, forgiveness can't get you out of zero sumness because the goal, I mean, you need to forgive first, but then the way to change zero sumness will be to recognize that you are like better together than the sum of the parts basically and that can only happen if it's also true that one plus one equals three when you're together basically rather than if you separate it and it's just two and that's not always the case we have friends who were in relationships where they're both 10 out of 10 people for someone but they're terrible for each other about like one couple that was in their relationship and it's like that can happen they're both great people 100 mm. percent, but together they're just like loose loose basically uh it's not even zero sum yeah so yeah no i think you need to understand whether you are a mutually beneficial relationship or not yeah i wonder if some couples as well actually see each other almost as competition in i don't know whether they play status games with each other um i, I i've never personally experienced it but I could imagine that is a thing that plays out because I, I you know we're both very competitive people mm -hmm. in certain ways but all of our competitiveness gets funneled through playing games against each other that's why games are so beautiful i think like they are a way they're this like healthy outlet where you can delve into wow I sound like a wow you're I know, you're an llm i'm an llm <laughs> you can delve into uh a Zero, a little zero sum universe for the for 30 minutes or something and that's there's a clear objective one of you is meant to crush the other and i don't know for us that is so it's it's just so fun and it never there's never like negative overspill it's always like an enriching thing so even that is like a sort of win winny thing um but i don't know we, we fundamentally see each other as as a team like when you do well in a business you know like when we were playing poker I would mean, never ever like 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 couldn't fathom ever being like jealous of your success, even though you would often win a lot more than me and were a better player than me. I was just on a spiral. What were you <laughs> on? What? I saw. I know you weren't listening to. What were you? What were you spiraling? <laughs> Wondering whether you're fake and actually a robot that is an LLM, and I've been living with an LLM my whole life, and <laughs> you just slipped up. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, uh, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> but I just imagined what it would be like to remember discover you, that. Remember the one where you had where you you had this vision of yourself that you were actually just an insane person who had dream, yes. dreamed me up. Because we, we, the first time it happened was when we were in New York walking down a street, and I knew you were in front of me, but then you weren't. It turned out that you just got into some store, but you just disappeared all of a sudden, and I it felt like this scene in a film where the character realizes that they might have just imagined all of this wonderful, great like relation that they had with someone. And all of the scenes were playing back, not all, but like a bunch of scenes were playing back in my mind of me sitting with you and our friends. And then like me just sitting by myself with my, with our friends and our friends being like, oh, he's insane. <laughs> my friends, our friends. Yeah, yeah like your imaginary girlfriend, yeah, 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 basically. Yeah, my imaginary girlfriend. Anyway. I mean... Crown up guy, Fedor Holtz, uh, asks, is there something that helped your relationship a lot that you weren't expecting or surprised you? What small thing would you say you did in your relationship, maybe regularly, that had the biggest effort or return? 
I think like the thing you previously mentioned is one of them, like the hissing at each other. Yeah. Like something, so that, um, yeah, to, to abstract it would be something that both parties have agreed is a quick and short uh, sign one can show each other that makes the other realize that they're... Um, they, they temporarily lost, the, you know, they've gone into the, yeah. the, the red mist. The alternative, instead of the hissing, would be to say, hey, you're currently being a bit irrational here or you're attacking me every time I say something or anything like that. But none of these things work because you can still respond to that right. somehow, right? Like, you're attacking me unjustly. It's like, well, no, you just did that thing and you totally deserve to be attacked would be the response. You can't respond to a hiss very much. <laughs> so if you can find an alternative of that or take the same thing, who cares? Uh, I think it's useful to have something that shows kind of the ridiculousness of the moment a little bit. So the hiss was incredibly high value for the easiness of adding it. If someone has a kind of bad pattern of behavior that they themselves likely would not to have, want to have, finding a way for them to um, like frame the concept around it such that it's really sticky yeah that 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 i think is helpful i mean and one of the most impactful books i ever read in terms of relationships and understanding relationships is this is this book the passion trap which talks about how over time a, a power imbalance can develop and it can be you know everyone usually thinks oh the man has more power than the woman it's often the other way uh whereby basically one feels a lot more secure in the, re the relationship than the other um one has more confidence and it sometimes it can switch if like let's say one loses their job suddenly and so now they're having a confidence crisis and then they start like feeling bad about themselves and then they start like needing more from the relationship and it can create this like separation where the the one down as it were the the one with less power becomes needier and like more demanding of the the other one who now finds them slightly less attractive and if that if that imbalance isn't addressed and realized for what it is it can very quickly spiral mm -hmm. and that's you, the most common ingredient of why relationships go wrong. Yeah, I thought it was a great book as well. And yeah. that leads to worsening patterns of behavior, basically. The neediness becomes needier. The like push away becomes more push away because it reacts to the neediness, etc. And the helpful thing there is basically that the book makes you realize that some things are um, a problem of the dynamic that rather than about the person. The individual, exactly. Yeah. And that's that's really helpful. And the thing, th uh, yeah, and just to say more on the power imbalance, like it, the way to keep balance is like, yes, in many relationships it will be the case that one person is more successful in their career than the other or one has a career and the other doesn't or, and, and therefore the financials may come from one person or not the other but you can in that has potency for creating a power imbalance but you can just uh, have it still be balanced by if it's the case that the other person maybe is more emotionally mature or like more outgoing it might even be that the person who has more of a career would is kind of more introverted uh, and in social groups doesn't actually is, uh, is not that active and feels that their partner is much more active and therefore often like liked is the one that gets invited is the one that like people talk to and they actually then are in, in one down despite having more financial career etc mm -hmm. success right it's totally there are a variety of like f uh, categories uh, within which one can be um comparatively uh, more successful at mm. than than the partner and it's good to real uh, and you're probably looking for a partner who is not just worse than you in every single category that'd be weird like one partner might be more attractive or just i don't know better at certain sports that you want to be better at like it just there's going to be something why you love love them and probably that's the thing that they have more power in that framework over you Another thing that came to mind that we do that is a small thing um, is I heard this couple that were together for 70 something years. They were asked what they do uh, to similar type of question to make it work for them. And the husband said that uh, he, te he they, they tell each other every night they go to bed that they love each other. And since then, now for years, uh, wh however we felt whatever happened, I've always said I love you before yeah. I close my eyes. And even though it's for you and it's probably nice for you to hear, even if we're like slightly annoyed at each other for something, it's also really just 
kind of has the same effect as doing like a, a gratitude journal or something. Yeah, it's, it's like, like you're putting yourself into a better state of mind by just expressing the I love you. Yeah. And also you're sleeping better, I would imagine. Um, it's just nice to end that way. You don't want to end on a negative. Yeah, never go to bed angry. Start. Yeah. Well, that's but that's hard. That's that's why I mean that's never go to bed angry is the kind of idea behind it. But because that's not actually achievable, like how would you say there are like right, sometimes you just are. Like yeah, there just are. The there's circumstances like, are there's so extreme. That, yeah. Imagine going for 10,000 days, not never going to bed angry. That's not going to work. Like no. you must be. I mean, it will if you're a great meditator or something. Uh, hats off to you. But just the easy thing to do is just to say I love you. And get to a place where you mean it as well. So actually, mm -hmm. not just I love think you. of something. Yeah. Think but of just something like about actually, them, like even though they might be driving say, you yeah. crazy at the time. Like, yeah, that that really helped. How have we dealt with jealousy in a relationship? We still have jealousy for sure. We've talked about it though uh, here just now as well. Um, the main aspects were one realizing that it wouldn't make sense for to expect that there would be zero crushes for either of us over the duration of our relationship. Given that, the expectation should be that there should be crushes. Therefore, um, it's not something you fault the other for when it does occur, but rather it's just like, oh, okay, so the environment is now that there is a crush. How do we go through that? And um, so that helped for conversation to be realized, communication to be improved on, on that topic. But then still... It's like, okay, do you now want the person to act on it? And this is where then jealousy would come from outside of the emotional when it moves into the physical, if, if it were to move into the physical exploration of the crush. That we haven't done because we're still too jealous for that. We're like, well, I suppose if your crush was so strong that you really felt that it would be necessary to act on it in some way, then maybe. But so far that strength of crush at least hasn't occurred for me and not for you. Um, and... Yeah, I, we, we don't also, the thing we don't have is a full expectation that for sure we have to stay mono for the next 50 years. We're very open to the idea of being open at some point. Yes. It's just that at present it doesn't make sense for us given we, like We just haven't felt state. the, I don't know, we haven't felt the overwhelming urge to do it. So uh, the thing that others would say though is, well, it's because of the jealousy, like wouldn't it be better if it didn't require an overwhelming urge, but you could just follow a smaller urge. And in that, you're kind of assuming like, yeah, it would be better if basically the cost was small, but currently it just isn't. It, it's just not that easy for the way our minds are at present, I think, to just let the other go loose. OCD on Twitter asks, has navigating the path of growth and change together or separately posed challenges for you? If so, what are the reasons behind these struggles? And if not, what factors have contributed to the smoothness of this journey? It's difficult when I would imagine it would be difficult in a relationship where one partner is has to stay at home and like tend to the house and family and kids and whatever, and the other partner is traveling and making career moves or even changes and therefore probably has to go through various types of growth by themselves, whereas the other one doesn't at the same time, or they don't talk about it. Um, could be very difficult, yeah, right? Because like you're changing as a person and the other one doesn't. With us, we're just talking so much about so many things. Yeah, we changed our careers together at the time, but we both talked about what we're doing to each other quite a bit. So like, I, th I feel like we grew together. Manisha asks, is there anything now, knowing what we know, we would have told each other 10 years ago when we first met. I don't know if I would want to say you've met your soulmate because then that would change. No need for that, yeah. You, I, mean, I, I worry about the like the time causality problem. Buy Bitcoin more. Yeah, buy, <laughs> buy, yeah, buy, more, buy, Bitcoin. buy, buy more Yeah, <laughs> buy more Bitcoin. That's Classic. Right. <laughs> yes. Fold the turn when uh, against Dan Smith. 10 years ago, actually. Would have been too late. I would have already lost Bitcoin on Mount Gox. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Get it out of Mount Gox would have been a good idea. Josh Thompson asks, do soulmates exist? I mean, 
to the degree to which it makes sense to have the concept of a soulmate, like if there is the word soulmate that is meaningful in any way, then yes, I think there are soulmates. My feeling on those types of questions is similar to that it's like in the same category of like, do you feel like you're exercising free will or do you have free will? It's like, well, I can see you ha having a justified framework where free will doesn't exist, where soulmates don't exist, etc. at all. But to the degree that the concept is understood when you communicate to someone else about this, and it does make sense, uh, then yes, I have free will because it makes sense to assume of the other to have free will to explain certain things that the you observe. The world appears that way when I make yeah. decisions. Yeah, and, yeah, thus, yeah. and yeah. it's a more useful way to describe situations than like talk about... Determinism. Yeah, yeah of very that's just like really hard to compute. Um, and similarly with soulmates, it's like, yeah, some people are just so clearly so right for each other that you could describe them as soulmates, I think. What comes to me when I hear the term soulmates is like this appeal to magic like is there some kind of magical thing or something bigger and beyond what science could ever explain and i have to say it does feel that way but then <laughs> the worst question is do you think there is a soulmate for everyone so the question is is like out, out of the eight billion people alive does you know every single person perfectly match with someone else with all, and precisely one other person that would be the so that is actually a very detrimental view if i think that would lead to bad outcomes if people believe that and it doesn't seem likely to me to be true whatsoever right, they're going to be always searching for per exactly. perfect 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 and perfect. you can yes. move on and then you get to like what's the perfect search stop algorithm again <laughs> yes right. it's a stopping algorithm yeah. yeah so imagine you have what's the average amount of uh, friends like people have that they talk to at least once a month to or something like that would probably be the cutoff line. Like 50 people, 30, 20, I don't know. something I don't, like I don't that. Know, 12 maybe? 10? Yeah, something like that. Let's call it 20. Um, so on top of that, uh, you also most of them are in couples, so most of them are not available actually. Um, and then you also have uh, just random people you run into while you're at the store, while you're like meeting friends of friends, etc. How many people do people have at least some word exchange with when they are per year constantly There's a lot of people, people who all the time don't interact with many people at all yeah One so if two. you're someone who interacts with very few people and you only interact with say like tens of people per year that you feel like you had sufficient opportunity to kind of understand whether there is something even like inter like oh we are having a good time talking to each other yeah across 100 people are you going to find someone you gel well with I would imagine so, right? Well, there, you, there, there's also the fact that if you if someone doesn't get to meet that many people, then their expectations sounds bad, but it, it's not at all bad. Like, but truly, like you're, you, I could see a world where some an extreme social butterfly, and then they never settle down because they're constantly meeting new people, and they're like, well, this person's even better than this, and this, yeah, and this, it can and this. Cut you in both ways. Right? Exactly. So it's it's not. It's not yeah. clear that one is superior than the other. Like, no, I'm not saying that it is at all. But I mean. Allowing for more search definitely allows for a better to find a better partner. We could switch, you know, we could go into the interviewer chair. No, there's no need for that. I want, I want to try sitting in that chair for once. I want to see how Can't it feels. Hello. Hello. Uh, welcome to the Win Win Podcast with Mr. Livbury. <laughs> <laughs> Skeptically Sassy asks, how and when is stubbornness good? When is it good and positive to want and hope your partner to change, evolve, and when is it not? I don't know. I, I've always struggled with the word stubbornness, frankly, because it's so... It feels like it's just used as a weapon uh, because it's hard to semantically define. Or it's, you know, it's easy to semantically define, but it's actually hard to define in terms of the practical thing that they believe they're being stubborn. It's like... What, so what do you think is an example where a bit of stubbornness is good and where is it bad? So an example where it'd be good to be stubborn is... Let's say you have a real passion, a hobby that you love doing, and your partner doesn't like the hobby that much. Being stubborn about keeping that hobby because it makes you happy and it's a an outlet that you would you really really enjoy. That would be an example of being stubborn in a positive way. Right. When stubbornness just means standing your ground justly, right. that's a good thing that you should have. And uh, in order to change and evolve, and when is it not? Yeah, there are, there are these concepts floating about, right? Of um, never try to change them, they, like etc. What what do you think is actually meant by it, and what's the um, thing that you 
personally believe. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I can imagine when they're like, "Oh, don't try and change change your partner." Right? It's 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 all balance. Like there are certain facets about you. Let's say when we first got together, that I felt like they were just hurting you. So it's really about like the intention. In good, in yeah, it's like the intention. In and in, in in, are you trying to change them to please yourself at a cost to them, or are you ch trying to change them? or help them change because th that will truly uplift them too in your best opinion so it's a it's coming from a position of good faithness that said like we aren't perfect evaluators of whether something is actually good for the other or not right. so because we don't have a view on their internal like relative well, exactly what's going on with them so you do probably want to defer on the side of like oh i feel the need to change them i'm doing it for, because i believe it's good for them and so on but it's like you should downweight that feeling by like 30 percent or 50 percent or whatever just because you don't actually have a full uh you can't fully picture what it's like to be them and understand why the, their mental models want this particular thing so much why are you fighting for a change is the main question right and if it can the example would be if you're want them to dress differently because you like to think of yourself as someone who is with a like hip or whatever <laughs> it's the least hip word hip. <laughs> someone who wears suits every day yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so maybe you, you just want love your that partner aesthetic. to do that then then that's a bad reason to change but uh if you're like trying to your partner never exercises and you're trying to change and make them have a habit of exercise that's good for them you should fight for that change i think i mean it, it it boils down to um it's one of my favorite quotes uh, by this guy forrest landry which is love is that which enables choice so are you are you coming from this when you're trying to like there's something about your partner that you feel like they should change is the thing that you are trying to help them change something that will enable them to be able to be more autonomous and make their own better choices for their own well-being and for yours and so on if that change is truly in service to that then i could see it being something that is actually you know uh, a, a good a good example of this but if it is not in service if it's not truly coming from this i am trying to help them upgrade their own ability to make their own choices if it's not coming from that as its foundation then it's probably a bad ex you know that's that you don't want to be doing that I think that's a good question. How much did money help your relationship? Traveling where and when, doing what you want, etc. Financial pressure adds major weight to even the perfect couple, says blah blah three three seven seven. <laughs> I thought you were just making that up. That's actually their name. Their name. Uh, I mean, yeah, the very, very valid point. Um, and that's you know, one of the ways how we've been lucky is that we, right, th we've been through kind of playing poker in our twenties. We had sufficient financial freedom to travel and have a lot of novel experiences where we didn't have to turn over kind of and double look on every single item that we spent money on like it wasn't an issue to while traveling get food in a restaurant or like order room service in the hotel like those weren't questions we needed to worry about and that for sure makes things easier anything that adds additional pressure to relationships whether it's it can be a financial thing or someone is having to caretake for an elderly you know their, their parent or something like that that's going to put a strain on a marriage or they they you have a bunch of children and like your time is just so constrained because you're literally just dealing with changing nappies or whatever it is you know all the children stuff um pressures in general are just going to make a relationship harder um and so again i mean but the same kind of principles it's like you're going to have therefore it's more likely that you're going to have conflicts and so on so you just really have to have solid found like a foundation of how you how you dialogue in that and also the the ability to like step outside of these situations and be like okay well look we're under additional pressure right now finances are tighter or i've got my mom living with us now and and so on acknowledging being mad at the situation as opposed to each other is really key. I think what you said is r very relevantly true across the whole domain of potential relationships. Um, that said, specifically advising on what if our financial situation was much worse or even much better, 
I don't know. I don't know how how, how it would have affected us. We only well, lived I mean, the one that we had. We did live through it. Like you you went on a huge downswing in poker. Oh yeah, I went. You went I, I was broke when we got together. You, you actually, were, we were literally broke when we got together. But, but it's 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 a different type of broke, right? Like it's it's. You like, had the ability to borrow, which exactly some don't. I was like, yes. there is. It's it's like people. Some people that are in business or whatever, they go broke and are like down millions, you know, and. Like, well, you have to be pretty wealthy and free to be able to be down millions be, because probably it means that your earning potential is so high that you can get it back. Right. There's, there's like privileged broke and non-privileged broke. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in this case, we were... I was definitely highly privileged You were pretty privileged, broke. yeah. Um, Just to make it clearer. So in 2013, after the first time that I had, like, as a 20, early 20-year-old, 20 like, oh, I have over a million dollars for the first time from poker. It was amazing. But then I lost it <laughs> within months and was in the minus uh, for the reason that um, you just move money around between people constantly because you're like, oh, yeah, here is a buy-in, et cetera, and you do accounting later. And the accounting turned out that I actually wasn't at plus some thousands, but actually minus some thousands. And um, that was stressful, but obviously my earning potential was very high then, so it all um, worked out. Arumambaru asks, please talk about spending time together and alone. What is your and Igor's sweet spot on this? Do you have any hobbies or workouts separately? So we do spend an extraordinary amount of time together. Um, we're probably in the like 90th percentile. Or more. Even. 95th, yeah, easily. Um, what do we do separately? I mean, I wouldn't... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what, are, what, what do we do separately we work homes. separately that's it we're, I mean, we're in different rooms sometimes not even right now moved in the same office to try out that uh, yeah. yeah so uh, we mostly meet friends together we go bouldering together we go hiking together we go on the lake together we just actually you do that sometimes without me i do more outdoorsy stuff than you i think i yes, i'm you more have a inclined need to go for and outdoorsy do... and i have a higher need for a computer you love computer <laughs> he would do a lot of computer let's let's finish on a nice story i feel like we haven't said any good stories the reason we're recording this is that it was our 10-year anniversary yes arguably in terms of total time spent with each other given that we spend like 350 out of 365 days a year together many many hours per day it's kind of nearly our 20 year anniversary already but the number is 10 officially so we made a prediction early on uh in our relationship of how likely it is that we'll still be together in 10 years how about we make predictions from today about how likely it is that we're still together in one year and 10 years think about it for a moment and then we will yell out the numbers at the same time wait should we do one year three year and ten year or just no, one, one and ten? ten conditional on the world being more or less the same okay conditional on the world being such that we can continue actually having conditional a relationship. on the world only having changed over the next three and ten years up to 2x as much as it has over the last 10 years conditional on us having corporeal forms such that we can have a relationship <laughs> together i think is maybe what you're getting at we're doing one year first mm -hmm. i'm just going to count us down to one zero and we're just saying the number at the same time Okay, well... Just say the number, okay? So, for one year, 99%. You got the same? Yeah, I, I was just debating whether I wanted to say 100 because like, no, I okay. actually think yeah. it's 99.9, .9, but we're... It's 99, yeah. Then, in 10 years, 94. 82. <gasps> <laughs> 82? <laughs> wow. Well, I... Uh, I don't know. What? A lot of things happen in 10 years. 82 is a high number for 10 years. Well, so when we did this 10 years ago, you, I think, Wait, our, I think num our, our 10 year was 75 and 80. Right. So you've, we've gotten through 10 years and you've only up weighted by 4%. It's a little Yeah, I think going 5%. through 10 years is uh, not a... Not that strong evidence on whether it was realistically 80 or 70 or 90 percent, you know. I think it's pretty strong evidence. No, that's just, we'll, we'll have to cut that out. That's bad math. 
By you. Base, base, no, by you. Base would say that the evidence is not very strong. A one off, an n of one, turning out one rather than zero, right? It happened rather than didn't happen. Doesn't give you a lot of information about whether the real likelihood of this was 80% or 90% or 70%. In all of these cases, you would very much expect to observe a single instance to occur rather than not occur. So you didn't get much um, information actually on the basis of it having occurred. That's one. So that's why we have to cut it out. <laughs> then, um, no, the reason is, I think actually the first 10 years are easy. Like at the time where we were, the first 10 years I think are easier than the next 10. A little bit is my assumption, to be honest. You say, so, so you, you I, think of like successful relationships, you know, 90, 95th percentile relationships, they still... They most, survive most initially. Of the time, I, you know, I think they break more often in the, the 10, 10 to 20, 20 year window than the... Interesting. No, sorry, because we didn't do it on day zero, right? Day zero would have been different. Obviously, right, we did it been. like six months in. In either case, I don't know. My number is pulled out of the ass. It's just like, I think going 95% and over for 10 years is kind of, well. I didn't do 95 and over. No, I'm just saying that why that, that I excluded as just, I just can't have any I'm just such surprised. Confidence. I'm surprised you're under 85. I think 82 is incredibly high. What? What is the uncertainty that I have to place on various things happening over the next 10 years with including inclusive of, as we talked about, getting a crush that's very strong. We just become poly. A career change or something. Yeah, but do you understand that one in six, roughly is what I said, is very small for a 10-year timeline. Igor, it's obviously fine. And like, if you had said 50 or 60, I would have been like, maybe. I think that's my, my, my rattle point is under 65 percent yeah if you had if you said under 65 i would actually been like oh uh, wow i'm gaining new information here i don't actually feel like i've gained any new information i'm surprised your high. number is 94 i'm i'm, I'm surprised you like that's, that's i know i'm just like I, I, it feels <laughs> i wonder if i asked you on another day it wouldn't be oh maybe yeah <laughs> I i'm, I'm, I'm exceptionally into we've, you today we've, we've, and we've i am had, a fickle, had, fickle we've mistress we've had a very good week basically we've had a great of, week of, 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 of as a as a couple <laughs> we sh so, we sh yeah maybe, so maybe we should ask it again i think like we should ask again because i tried to get to a number that is independent objective of my here we go no we independent me? of my current emotional state <laughs> not objective that's, just subjective that's douche for the word that's douche for objective just fyi <laughs> fair <laughs> independent of my current emotional state um no it's still subjective but anyway um I appreciate the 94%, but I think you would actually, in, I think that's the highest number you would ever choose. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the top end of my range, sure. I, <laughs> um, okay, so I think what we can settle on is that we are above 80, we're somewhere around 88% likely if we take the average that's of the, the average, I feel yes. like you're being a little... Conservative. Conservative. Yeah. I'm probably being a little aggressive. Um, so yeah, I, I here's here's to eighty eight percent chance of a wonderful future together over the next ten years. Oh, I love you. I love you too. So there we are. Uh, huge thank you to Igor for bravely sitting down with me to talk through this. Also, thank you to myself, I think, for soldiering through uh, what was probably my hardest interview. Frankly, it's it's very strange sitting down with someone who you know so well in a kind of like semi-formal environment where you're kind of the boss, but not, and I don't know, hopefully something useful uh, comes out of this for, for you guys watching, or at least something entertaining. Uh, so yes, may all your love lives and relationships be happy, whatever form they take. Uh, and even if it's just with yourself, love is the answer. This is, yeah, I'm starting to sound like Lex now. Um, Lex is awesome. You should check out his podcast if you haven't as well. Anyway, I'm going to stop rambling. I will catch you next time. Bye.